All right, so here we go. We're off to play around with the sous vide machine. I've been looking forward to playing around with the sous vide machine, sous vide, and uh, I haven't had a chance. Finally, I got a morning off here, so we're gonna whip up some Leoner to cook in the sous vide setup back there. What is Leoner? Leoner is the Northern European equivalent of bologna. Uh, the differential, differential factors are, it's usually mostly made out of pork, sometimes it has some beef, uh, depending on the region you're in, and uh, it's seasoned up a little different. American bologna or the stuff you get out of Italy, has got uh, salt, white pepper, paprika, garlic. Leoner is a little more mild. Salt, 15 grams per kilogram. White pepper, four grams per kilogram. Nutmeg, one gram per kilogram. Mace, one gram per kilogram. Coriander, two grams per kilogram. Cure, three grams per kilogram. Sodium erythrobate, half a gram per kilogram. And I'm gonna put binder in mine, uh, 10 grams per kilogram. And we're gonna put ice in at 200 grams per kilogram. Uh, this is normally an emulsified sausage, so it will be run through a bowl cutter. Uh, my bowl cutter is down and out. You know, if you've watched the videos before, it sits over my right shoulder. So we're gonna try and make an emulsification in the sausage grinder. I'm gonna use the big sausage grinder today because I'm gonna do a decent sized batch to test out how well the sous vide machine circulates the water, cooks it and all that stuff. And so what are we gonna make it out of? Like I said, Leona is pork. And um, I just have some basically pork loin ends that we've trimmed off. When we are cutting pork chops and things like that, it's the little ends that get squared off. So it's very nice lean meat. You can see a little bit of fat there, a little bit of marbling. So that means very lean. We're gonna wanna add some fat to it. So I have some nice, beautiful pork back fat we're gonna add to it. We're going to run it through the meat grinder a few times to try and simulate a very, very fine emulsification texture like bologna. So, Let's get started on that process. I got everything else prepped and ready to go, so I'm gonna chop this up, get it in the grinder. Nice, beautiful, lean pork, and it is semi-frozen. Like, it's in little itty-bitty chunks that my grinder can probably handle, but I just pulled this out of the freezer yesterday, so it needs to be broken down into chunks that will fit through my grinder. Ooh, my fat is pretty froze. <laughs> if you guys are monkeying around with frozen, semi-frozen meat, these big knives are nice because you can, I'm sure if you can see, kind of get your fingers out of the way. I can use a flat palm, I can use the base of my hand, and my fingers, as you can see, are away from that cutting edge of the blade. You know, you still can twist on frozen meat. Frozen meat is the most dangerous to work on, but a little tip, it kinda is nicer to use this big blade. It keeps your fingers away from the blade. It just dawned on me too, as I'm opening up these bags of trim and getting them ready to make the Leoner. Leoner is a great candidate if you want to make a mac and cheese loaf. Uh, that's what we make. I don't make mac and cheese loaf. I don't stock it for the store, but we have made it in the past by request. So you basically you cook your mac and cheese ahead of time, cool it down, and then after this is fine ground, you toss it in at the end and uh, right before your cook step. The macaroni is pre-cooked, but then you cook your meat with the macaroni in at the end and you have mac and cheese loaf. That's what Leona is also good for. Now I know you've probably heard if you've watched other sausage channels or you watch my channel, that it's good to keep the meat cold uh, for bacteria reasons and uh, to run through your meat grinder more efficiently. In this case, it's gonna be quite important because we're gonna do a couple grinds on the meat and I'm probably gonna end up refreezing the meat after a grind because I think I'm going to run this through the grinder about three or four times and then we're going to give it a very thorough mix step at the end. There is a tub of meat and uh, you can see now why I'm using the big grinder. This would take quite a while to quadruple grind with our little hand grinder and uh, before we start our grinding process I'm going to get that sous vide water heated up so that it's ready to go when we got our stuffing done. The hose is nice and warmed up. Basically, I'm just adding warm water to this cooler till it's about this full. Plug the sous vide in, let her warm up. Uh, I'm gonna see what temperature I'm doing this at and preset the machine. Okay, so I have these timetables here that show us the time temperature relationship that is required to kill things like salmonella and trichinosis. Um, 
Because the idea of a sous vide machine is to kind of go slow and low for a long time. And I'm hoping with this emulsified sausage that we get a very smooth texture. There's no wrinkles in the outside of the casing. And so it's telling me I can kill trichinosis if it reaches 60 and I hold it there for a minute. Um, and uh, 60 degrees, if I hold it there for 12 minutes, it will kill salmonella. I couldn't find one on E. coli this morning. So I think we'll just take it up to a little bit higher. Um, I know I have a recipe from Olds College that said to cook at 63 for two hours kind of thing. But uh, we're gonna go with, yeah, we'll go up to, get it up to 63, I guess. So that'll kill trichinella instantly. 63, we're gonna hold it there for four minutes and that'll kill salmonella. How am I gonna be able to tell what the temperature is in there, though, without being able to probe them? Well, I'm gonna run a little probe in from the outside. Awesome audio work by yours truly. Seems like I can't get a video recorded without botching a bit of audio somewhere, but I'm just explaining that uh, I'm gonna send that meat through on a coarse plate for the first grind. It's a little easier, a little res less resistance on the machine. Um, it's a seven and a half horsepower grinder, so it's going to go on a 4.5 millimeter plate. And then we're going to switch over to a three millimeter plate. Just snug everything up before you get started. Make sure that blade is nice and tight to the plate, and it'll get your meat cut better. There's the meat after the first grind. We did it on a 4.5 millimeter plate. Looks awesome as is. Okay, I won't need this shield anymore. We'll take our wrench tool. For the finer plate. Okay, plate and blade stay together. New plate is on. Let's do that again. Now that I remembered to turn my audio on, sorry about that. Here we go. All right, there we have it. Nice pork. You can notice the fat particles are starting to stand out less and less already. So if we do this a couple more times, they should blend into a uniform, homogenized texture. Okay, that's grind number two. Let's take our thermometer in there. All right, it's still 31 degrees. 30 degrees, perfect. So let's run it through again. And you can see it's starting to come off in longer strands. So there's kind of some already natural protein extraction happening. And uh, you can see a bit maybe, the fat starting to blend the whisker. Okay, that's gr fine grind number two. Okay, hasn't heated up yet, still at 31 Fahrenheit. 30, 30. So we're good to send it through one more time. That'll get us grind number three. Okay, and there's the third grind. And the fourth grind is gonna be our final grind. And you can see it's starting to go from like, if you click back, rewind the video a bit, you can see that first grind is very particular particulated particulates all over the place. And now it's starting to look closer to that pink slime that Jamie Oliver's terrified of and the stuff that they say chicken McNuggets are made out of. But uh, we're gonna turn this into delicious. Okay, so it's been through that fine grind three times and like I said on the fourth one here is gonna be the final grind. So that means we're also gonna add our spices. Now in an emulsification, they run them in those bowl cutters with knives that are spinning nonstop till the emulsification reaches 11. Uh, because there's more protein extraction happens actually at a warmer temperature. So I'm gonna mix these. These are just for myself, they're not for the store. Um, I'm gonna give them away to people. We are going to mix them till they reach 11. And the longer we mix, again, more uh, homogenized or blended this product should become, more smooth, less particles, less visual difference. And in order to get a longer blending time in the bowl cutters, they will use ice instead of water, cold, cold water. Because obviously ice is colder and that allows you to blend longer. So we're gonna use ice today instead of water. 
uh, for this one in hopes that we get a more uniform texture. Okay. Meat's in. We'll pull the clutch out. Now it's just gonna just mix, not grind. Oh, the spices smell good. The coriander pops out. So we'll blend that, throw that on there and let it blend in for us. Spices first, ice second once it starts to warm up. All right, it's been mixing for nearly 15 minutes and it's only come up a couple degrees. So this isn't quite the machine to get a perfect emulsification out of. Um, so instead of adding straight ice, I've decided to change my method and that's a ice water slurry and just mix it till all this water is absorbed. Then we're gonna run it through for that fourth grind. All right, I can wait no longer. It's been mixing for another five minutes. Here's our fourth and final grind. We're gonna take this first handful that comes out. It's kind of the stuff that sat in the throat of the grinder and is unseasoned. We're gonna add it back into the grinder, mix it around for a minute and finish that grind. Just thought I'd give you guys a little close up of it after it came out of the grinder. Didn't quite achieve emulsion, perfect emulsion texture. It's gonna have kind of a little bit of particulates in it, but uh, that's okay for using just a meat grinder. So on to stuffing. Okay, and if you've seen it once, you've seen it a thousand times. Get our emulsified mixture. Emulsified-ish mixture into the stuffer and pat it down trying to get out all the air pockets you can. We're gonna have to do this in a couple runs because it's a bit of a bigger batch. And we're gonna use these plastic large diameter casings. Don't need to pre-soak, pre they're just for water cooking. And I'm gonna stop them a little bit short because I was just kind of eyeballing it there when the sausage was mixing. And I didn't think that it would maybe fit all the way in the cooler if I stuff these to max capacity. So I'm gonna stop them a couple inches short. The key with these is squeeze good and tight. They don't really have any expansion, so you just fill them right to the limit. And then let them slide through your hand. Perfect. It's gonna be a fairly big batch. I'm gonna take a couple casings to get her all stuffed and probably two rounds of stuffing. But I wanted to test out the capacity of that sous vide machine. How quick will the water recover? Does it distribute the water heat evenly? You might also be thinking, why is there a cure in this? It's not getting smoked. It's not going to be in the danger zone. It's kind of just a feature of the product. You could smoke this product since it has cure accelerator and uh, cure in it. You could put this in a fibrous casing and or hot dog casings and run it through your smokehouse right now and you'd have European Wieners, sort of. Okay, just a handful left to add and we're done. Alrighty, there we go. Finally, the end of it. Now, two alternative tying techniques for you. The first tying technique has nothing fancy to it at all. Just squeeze it down, spin it till it's good and tight and there's no kind of wrinkles throughout the sausage. While it's tied up tight, just give it a double knot. Nothing hard about that. Some people say they're worried about it blowing out and stuff, but that more so matters, I guess, like when you're hanging it from the smokehouse and it will want to expand as it heats and comes out the bottom. I have had that happen, but it's very rare. Next, alternatively, I have a little machine for it here and I'll bring you in to show you how it works. But you might've seen there's in Cabela's and stuff like that, there's those little pliers with the hog rings or the hog clamps. Uh, and it's just a metal kind of U-shaped ring that kind of pinches over top of the plastic and stops the sausage from leaking out. But I don't have a little set of pliers. I have this one for doing big sausages like this. The con on these is since it's metal on plastic, if you push too hard, you're gonna poke a little hole inside your casing and that's gonna be a spot for the sausage to expand out of and blow up into the bottom of your smokehouse or into your water cooker or whatever. But basically you just twist her up really good and tight. There's a little slot here on the machine. Set it down on there. Make sure the little hooks are fed. And kind of just give her a little push and voila, you have a tied sausage end. Now let's do another quick little close up of this guy. 
So you give it a twist and you can see nice and smooth, no wrinkles. Set it right in here. The hog rings are right there. Comes down, grabs one out of there. Put a little pressure. And you can see that little metal ring on there. That's not going anywhere. But like I said, tying works just as good. So I'm gonna do these up and let's plop them in the sous vide. All right, there's that hot water. Normally you're supposed to bag them before they go in, but I'm just gonna put them straight in the hot water. I'm not too concerned about flavor leaking out the end. And I, uh, I tied half and crimped half. So we'll do a little test and see if any of them blow out or can you get away with just using the old knot, not having to buy another trinket. It's going to overflow. A little worried about water circulation, being able to get at all the sausages. These top ones, you know, I don't want the tops to not get cooked, but we'll uh, really have anything thin enough to weigh them down. Something heavy, I need a little plate. Look at this. The patty plates off my burger machine are gonna work oh so perfect. There we go. Bit of monkeying around to get her to work. So I'm shooting for 63 for four minutes, so I'm gonna set it at 65, just a little bit above our set temperature. And I'm gonna run it for, I don't know, we'll see if we get there within three hours. Okay, so after plopping the meat in here, the meat was probably at about five degrees Celsius by the time we were done there. This cooler was heated up to 63. It has dropped down to 56 Celsius, and it's probably gonna stabilize there, it looks like, and climb back up to 64. And we're gonna cook till we hit an internal temperature of 63 for four or five minutes, if I catch it in time. So let's see how it goes. Okay, so they've climbed up to 34, which means they've definitely been at 33 for 34 minutes. Oh, they're just floating back and forth now. You can see, so I think our timing is pretty much perfect. Um, you can see I had to put my big grinder throat on here because it's starting to push the lid up. But we're gonna have a look at these guys, see how they look. Shut this off. Thanks for your service, Mr. Sous Vide. There we go, that's what the inside looks like. I am going to dump that water out and run some cold water over these guys for a while till they cool right down. Okay, it is quite piping hot. 63 degrees Celsius is still too warm to touch, so let me dump some out like this. All right, so I'm just gonna run them under cold water like this for kind of about 20 minutes, half hour, till they're cooled right down, continually cycling the water. If I had ice, I would throw the ice in there too, but you wanna make sure you continually cycle the water because they're quite hot. It's a big mass. You wanna get them all cooled right down. All right, so they're in a the cooler right here, you just off screen, but uh, we've got the bulk of the heat out of them. So I'm just gonna hang them up and uh, let them cool overnight in the cooler. And then we'll slice into them tomorrow and see how they are. And uh, we'll push them into the cooler just like that. Okay, so it's time for the conclusion of our sous vide experiment. Cooled down, it got a little bit of wrinkles as it cooled down. I was hoping it to not shrink at all, but maybe I had it a little too warm for a little too long. We'll just crack into this. And these plastic sausage casings peel off nice and easy compared to those fibrous ones. Voila, there we go. German bologna. Looks good. Couple little air pockets in there, but uh, you can't really poke the casings when they're going direct into water, otherwise you lose some of your juice and whatnot. But there's not a bunch of gel and fat at the end, which means all of our moisture stayed inside the deli cut. Let's cut into this here and see. See how many particulates we got. So you still have a little bit of uh, fat, but that's not bad for having a 30% fat content sausage. Looks pretty good. Let's put some on the slicer and have a taste. All right, I got the slicer getting dirty today anyway, so we may as well stick it on there. Slice it nice and thin. Try out our Northern European bologna. 
slice is pretty nice. Slice is pretty good. Some good protein extraction. Let's try a bite. Should be nice and mild. Mmm. Super soft. Very juicy. I was wondering what the texture would be like since you finished it at a slightly lower temperature, but it's perfect. Sandwich meat consistency, so yeah, I'd give that two thumbs up. That's a new cooking method. And uh, that's a delicious sausage. It doesn't have any smoke flavor, obviously, because we cooked it in water, so you don't necessarily need cure in this. You could do this without the cure if you wanted to, and you'd probably wind up with about the same product, but just put a little bit more salt in. But overall, it was really good. I hope you guys like the sous vide sausage experiment, and I think we'll play around with it some more. I was looking into time temperature exposures, so you can cook this sausage for a longer time at a lower temperature, but I was curious if it would affect the texture. Maybe that'll be the next video. Anyways, thanks again, guys. Take care.